In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ, the true light, who enlightens and sanctifies everyone who comes into the world, cause the light of your countenance to shine upon us, that in it we may see your unapproachable light, and guide our steps to the doing of your commandments at the intercessions of the Most Holy Mother of God, and of all the saints. Amen. Um, right. Well, the last, uh, this last few weeks we've been talking a lot about Holiness and passions, and last week was confession. And I sort of want to carry on with this uh, by talking about, mainly about marriage, because a lot of people don't associate it with, you know, uh, holiness and repentance. They think of that only of monasticism in that sense, you know, monks and nuns. And that's a, a big misconception, because marriage is actually one of the the paths to acquiring that kind of um, holiness. It's, it's a way of living the Christian life. And many argue that there are sort of two ways which are blessed by the church. And the one is, is marriage and the other one is monasticism. Um, and there's some dispute about whether there is, you know, there are exceptions to that, you know, simply living the celibate life and so on. But I want to focus mostly on, on marriage today. But the marriage and monasticism have more in common than people realize because I think one of the reasons people would consider them those two to be um, sort of blessed ways of life is because they are both commitments to to something apart from ourselves where there is a sacrifice of the will, there's a sacrifice of freedom and there's life within a community of some form. Um, so I want to talk about why, how the church understands marriage. We, we speak of a marriage as a sacrament of the church. And when we speak of sacraments, there's lots of definitions of them. Uh, but I think the most important thing to remember about a sacrament is that it's usually a sacrament because it's connected in somehow to the Eucharist, to the liturgy which is really the ultimate sacrament. Um, when the bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Christ, and it's through this that we are all united and are, are one church. And marriage is, is often, it's been, uh, people have speculated that marriage often took place during the liturgy in the ancient times. I think that's um, disputable. But certainly in the very early church, there was no marriage service itself. The people... Christians who wanted to get married got the blessing of their bishop. They got married by the local authorities. And the sacramental act was actually the coming together to church to receive Holy Communion together. The newlyweds would take Holy Communion. So there was the idea that for something to be brought into the spiritual life of the church, into the sacramental life of the church, it always culminated in this, this act of Eucharistic unity. And even though the the marriage itself doesn't take place within the context of the liturgy usually, though sometimes that happens. Um, we should remember, keep that in mind, that idea of the, the Eucharistic unity. Of course, this assumes that the two are members of the same church because you can only receive communion if you're baptized Orthodox Christian in the Orthodox Church. Uh, nowadays, with mixed marriages... It's, it's a bit harder to explain this, this sense of the complete unity because it's never made possible with a, uh, when there's someone who's not a member of the Orthodox Church. But we should bear in mind what the Church has as the ideal, is that the, the married life isn't just about we love one another, therefore we get married. And it's not just um, sort of an expression of mutual love, but it's always connected with faith. It's always connected with we are now traveling together as one towards the same goal, which is to our salvation, to union with God. And that's how we have to understand the orthodox understanding of marriage. Uh, it's problematic when people kind of, they forget all of that. They come to the church, they want to get married because it's romantic or because you know, they have a certain idea of how the marriage should be. But there's no actual... It's kind of there's a big gap between what they think the church marriage is and what the church thinks that the church marriage is. Um, so I want I want to sort of um, speak a little bit about 
uh, the, I guess the marriage service itself, um, we we sort of have two, the service is, is one of two halves. We first have this sort of the betrothal ceremony where we have the blessing and exchange of the rings. Uh, and of course, rings are not unique to Orthodox uh, Christianity. But when you hear in the, in the service, the last prayer of the service actually talks so many times about how rings were used in, in, in the scriptures. We have many cases of how the ring was a sign of, of a promise or a pledge um, in the Old Testament. And it immediately connects those being married with all these saints of the Old Testament. When we hear the, the wedding service, we hear countless times all these references to these, these great figures of the Old Testament. And it's quite an uplifting thing because it reminds you that through marriage you're almost you know you're you're sort of part of that company of the saints and that you are called to acquire sainthood effectively through through marriage. Um, and the second part of the service is it's it does seem a lot like the liturgy. Um, we begin with the same blessing: "Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit." And it's worth remembering, therefore, that. The marriage is a, a journey to the kingdom of God. Uh, that the couple are now journeying together to that goal together. Um, again, there are many prayers referring to many passages in the scriptures. The, there's the joining of the hands, uh, which signifies that it's the church which joins a couple together. That however much a couple may love one another, or whether they're civilly married, it's actually it's it's the church which join joins them together, and so it shows that the what makes the marriage meaningful and binding isn't the individuals, the, the couple being married, um, but uh, that the that act of faith and union through the church. And that's not to say, of course, that you know that marriage is supposed to be uh, loveless or you know marriages of convenience and so on, but these things have to be sort of sanctified and brought within. The, the life of the church because even through marriage even sexual love can become a means of union with God I think a lot of people might be shocked to hear someone say that but I think it is the case people often think of marriage as a compromise that if you want to be really religious and you want to progress in spiritual life you know you have to give up not have any of these obligations uh, be a, a monk and so on uh, and we forget that that's not the only way to holiness. And of course, that, that idea has been influenced by St. Paul, who said that he, he said it's better to actually be unmarried than married. But when you consider all the, the married saints who became holy through marriage, you know, that thing that has to be read in context. But we have a very superficial understanding of holiness, that we, we think of the monk in a cell praying all day long. And we don't forget that learning to be patient you know, with, with your spouse, learning to ra raise your children as Christians um, is an, an incredible uh, a sacrifice. And it, it does require, uh, it does actually, it is a path to acquiring the virtues. Uh, in fact, I think the marriage in many ways is, is harder than monasticism in the sense that you constantly have to sacrifice your will, you're constantly having to, have your, your patience is always tested, you know, you forego many things uh, for the sake of others. And if that's not a good training to learn to love your neighbor as yourself, I, d I don't know what is. So marriage is, is a, a path to holiness. And this is also part of the significance of the crowns we have in the Orthodox service, because um, the main part of the service isn't the rings, but the, the crowning of the couple. And the crowns, first of all, uh, you know, symbols of of victory and of uh, accomplishment. I mean, even to this day, you know, in the Olympics, you know, they crown the winning athletes, and it's sort of a mark of that uh, this milestone you've reached. Also, of course, they are symbols of kingship that you are you know, now the king and queen of your own household. You are going to start your own domestic church, so to speak, uh, with a family. And also, they're crowns of martyrdom. Because we, we hear references to the martyrs being crowned quite a lot. And that's significant because it reminds us that to be married, it's not always going to be bliss and romance. That there is a sense of you have to... There's some suffering involved as well. There's that sacrifice of, of will as well. Um, so 
it shows how that the the spiritual life is actually you know not something that's up and opposed to uh, married life, but actually a means of a quite of uh, practicing the spiritual life. Um, there's also in the actual um, service itself very interesting. We hear we have like we have in the liturgy, we have a, a reading from the epistle and a reading from the gospel. And the epistle reading from Saint Paul is interesting, and it's often misunderstood, where Saint Paul compares the husband and wife to Christ in the church. And he says that, you know, you must be uh, subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so because he's making this comparison, he, he begins by addressing the wives and says, wives, you should uh, obey your husbands as, you know, be subject to your husband as Christ, the church is to Christ. And of course that uh, upsets a lot of women. Um, but the problem is people stop listening because then he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He sacrificed himself. He humbled himself and died on the cross. So it's not about the one being subject to the other. It's because people stop listening at that point. <laughs> it's that there's a mutual uh, subjection. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful image because this is one of the main images we actually have for the church. is the idea of the church as the bride of Christ. Um, the idea that we have become as intimate with Christ as a husband and wife, that complete uh, unity, uh, becoming one flesh. Um, and that, it shows you that actually marriage is actually a sort of, uh, I use the word microcosm, but I know most people don't know what that means, but it's like a, uh, a microcosm of the church in the sense that it's like it's like a it's like it's a symbol of the church marriage is a symbol of the church and saint paul says in the epistle um that this is a great mystery i mean christ in the church he wasn't saying marriage is is the mystery but in as much as marriage imitates that unity between christ and the church it is a sacrament it is something which does actually bring us closer to god um and of course, the, the marriage service really, I guess, uh, the, the high point is after the, the crowning. We then, the couple drinks from the common cup. Um, some have speculated this may once have been the Holy Communion, but I'm not sure that's the case. But either way, what the common cup symbolizes is the, the idea of the shared life. That there's no more, you're not, in, you're not individuals anymore, you will share in all things. Uh, and then you, the couple is led in procession around the altar as we sing some hymns. Uh, to the mother of God, to the apostles and to the martyrs. And this is where the couple, it shows that the couple will now always walk together on that spiritual journey uh, to the kingdom of God. So marriage is, is very much connected with holiness. It's very much connected with battling the passions and acquiring the virtues. Uh, and it should not be seen as something that is separate. And of course a lot of people can a lot of people can sort of, there's always the danger of using the married life as an excuse to forego a lot of religious practices because I don't have time because I've got this and because I've got that. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that's, that's the case where, you know, we not, the same thing can't be expected of everybody. But we have to be careful that these are not used as an excuse to simply be spiritually lazy with our life. Um, and there's, you know, it's very important as well that we understand the family as a, a church in the sense that um, the children are, you know, the parents are partly responsible for, for raising their children as, as Christians, practicing Christians. And there's, there's praying together in the, at the home, there's praying together at meal times, that there's attending church on Sundays, that there's receiving communion, that there's uh, fasting. Um, so there, there has to be the idea of a Christian family and a Christian home is different to what we normally understand. Just as the a church marriage and a civil marriage are not the same. That that should also be reflected in the life of the married life of a Christian family. Um, that it is a spiritual life, although it's you know everyone, you know just like everybody else, people marry, they have children, but there's still a difference for a Christian, um, and that that should be reflected in the home and in the upbringing of children and so on. Um,
Do you have any questions? No. I take it all off when I'm going. Okay. You look like you have a question. <laughs> um, yes, I can't uh, think of anything else to add right now to that. Oh, not late comers. Well, um, I'll, I'll say a little more as well about then uh, about monasticism, although I'm sure it doesn't interest you a great deal. Um, but like I said, there, there is a, a comparison between them. And some people question the idea of the monastic life because monastic life usually is, it involves a sort of separation from, from the world where you go, you know, you're part of a monastic community. Um, but people would argue, well, you know, if you're not living in the world, you know, and doing acts of charity and stuff, are you really a Christian? Um, I can understand why people say that, but I think it's, you know, it's a bit one-sided in the sense that just as, you know, married people are not expected to be doing vigils or every night like monks do, then, you know, it doesn't, you can't expect, not everyone is going to be doing the same things to the same degree. That there are certain callings to certain uh, ways of life. Um, and, you know, for, for one person, prayer is more central than it is for another, and, and vice versa. So, um... But the the uh, monastic life is not should not be understood as something where we do it because we dislike the world, that we leave the world out of hatred for it, but rather actually because we love it, and because we we wish to come closer to God that we may pray for it more ardently. And also throughout history, a lot of the time, monasticism, although it's obviously understood as a lifelong commitment, just as marriage is. It was also not always the the idea of the com the complete seclusion was not always uh, a permanent thing. That often you'd find in many places of classic saints who were responsible for monasticism, like Saint Anthony the Great, he went off into the wilderness for like you know forty years as a recluse, and yet somehow people had heard of this holy person out there in the desert, and, you know, and I guess people would now and again make contact with him and so on, and eventually you know. He opened his doors to the world and received you know, masses of people who came to be healed or to hear his words. And we find a similar case with St. Basil the Great in the 4th century who kind of went to disclusion and then returned to the world you know, when he saw the, all the suffering and the poverty that was going on and tried to sort of bring the, well, his experience of that shared monastic life, try to bring that to bear on, on the society and try to set up a monastery within the big cities where he worked with nurses and doctors and so on to look after the poor and so on. So we ended up with a form of monasticism which ended up more engaged with the world, but taking on in on mind the monastic ideal of the shared, everything is shared, no one possesses anything and so on. So monasticism is not always completely un, you know, disconnected or, or unconcerned with things that are going on in the world. Uh, but both, the marriage, both marriage and monasticism are ways of acquiring holiness, ways of learning to love, learning to acquire divine love. And we shouldn't, obviously there are differences between the two, but we should also remember the similarities that, you know, St. John Chrysostom, he said that you're, you're gravely mistaken, he said to this uh, Christian father, he said, if you think one thing's the mind of the monk and another thing of the layman, because the only difference is whether they're married or not. And every, everything else, they were quite to do the same things. We were all expected to reach the same height. So there's the idea that through marriage and through family, you can acquire the same degree of holiness as a monk in a monastery. And that's something you should remember uh, as married people. Um, so, you know, marriage is not an excuse to shirk religious responsibilities. Uh, but it's also, it shouldn't be seen as a compromise, as though, yeah, holiness, that's just for, for the monks and the clergy. Where every Christian is called to holiness. Uh, in every baptism, we, we hear about this calling to be a child of light, a vessel of, of the Holy Spirit, an heir of the kingdom of God. And each person finds that way, that path. Uh, through some, it's, it's family and marriage. For others, it's monasticism. For others, it might be something else. Uh, 
But marriage is one of the, I guess, the one of the sort of holiest ways. It's like I said, of all the ways of acquiring holiness, marriage is the the one that's always been singled out as a sacrament. One could even argue it's considered the best or the the holiest in a sense. Um, so it's something which, yeah, we need to bear in mind that when we, you know, when people plan to get married or when people um, think about, you know, married life and the raising of children, that we have to remember what, what marriage is as far as the church is concerned. That it isn't just about a couple. It isn't just about uh, you know, just raising children and, and then that, that's it. There's a, there is a, a path to holiness. And that means that, you know, I think one of the reasons that marriages break down, I mean, I'm talking within Christian uh, society is that people do forget that you know marriage means like monasticism I have to sacrifice my will there's going to be some suffering involved there's going to be uh, you know I have to learn to acquire all these virtues and if I'm not interested in carrying out that spiritual battle and you know the moment for example I'm not feeling happy I you know the marriage falls apart then we've misunderstood the point of marriage because the purpose of marriage is not actually happiness, any more than the purpose of monasticism and happiness. But happiness, the true happiness, which is the spiritual happiness we seek, we do find not through marriage or through monasticism, but through that, that, per, that uh, attempt to acquire union with God. Um, and like I said, monasticism, like I said, is a calling, but so is marriage. And so we choose the path which is best suited to us. For someone who is not called to monasticism but tries it, it would be complete misery for a lot of the time, just as someone who isn't cut out for marriage would be perhaps miserable in that situation. But it does not mean that the purpose of those vocations is to be happy. Because you you know, you know, don't know what lies ahead. Marriage can, can uh, create a lot of unhappiness, as, as can monasticism. And for as long as that isn't the purpose of that vocation, of that way of life, there's hope that that way of life is going to bring you to salvation, that it is going to teach you the virtues. Anyway, I think I have said enough. Um, so if you don't have any questions, we can leave that there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your time again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.